Hi, Jen Marshall, Head of uh, Profession for Social Development at DFID. Um, just to echo the panellists, thank you ever so much. It's been a pleasure to be involved in this over the months that it's been in um, production. And I'm really great to see the product, um, both the short and the long version, as Caroline says. Um, and I think it makes a really good contribution to a range of interrelated debates that we're all grappling with at the moment that are really rising up the agenda, whether that's leaving no one behind, tackling and getting to zero in extreme poverty, inequalities, girls and women, shared pro um, prosperity and progress. It's making a good contribution across the, the piece and really fundamentally tackling those underlying barriers um, that keep so many people locked out of progress, which, as you say, we need to keep coming back to in whatever sort of framework we're using, whatever sector that we're working on. Um, we, like others, really like the, the framework and can see real um, benefit for using that and applying that as we go forward and really like the positive approach of that this is possible. So my comments now, I think, are more about how we do this, given these are not new issues that you know we've talked about over the years and... You know, it's in some ways it's repackaging and trying to give an extra boost and an additional analysis using an opportunity, but really going back to some core principles that, that are evolving but haven't changed over time. Um, one thing that, that I reflect on quite often is that using, I don't use the word groups anymore, I use the word huge populations, <laughs> um, which I don't know, maybe that's packaging, but I think we have to start getting away from the idea that these are add-on groups, just as you say. These, these are significant gr overlapping groups, both characteristics and populations. Secondly, I do think we have to get smarter as to how we talk to those sectors that we all want to pick this up. Um, and I think the bank and your team are very, very well placed to do this with regards to economic growth and prosperity. Um, these issues underpin, it's the so what, what do you do, how does the programme look different? How does the investment look different? And to be able to really help people to see that very, very tangibly without getting sort of lost again in the complexity. Um, and then on that note, I think that we all have a collective responsibility of thinking about really clearly picking up on the what works section of to really move that forward. Um, and to stop this being the add-on projects, but to very much, as Caroline says, get this into everybody's business um, and to make, not just make those cases, but to very much go for where the agendas that matter. I'm really pleased that you mentioned political settlements and working <coughs> politically, for example. Um, and we look forward to carrying on the discussion to see where we and the bank and others need to be to really get this locked in properly. Great. Many thanks, Jen. Uh, Francis. Um, Francis Stewart, uh, Oxford University. Um, it sounds really interesting, and I'm sorry I haven't read it before. Um, very, very, um, very sort of along the same lines I've been thinking. I, I just wanted to comment on two areas. One was when you came to sort of policy, it was very projectized, you know, looking at the World Bank projects. And I don't think you're going to get anywhere very far on projects. I think it has to be. Uh, across the board policies. It may be positive discrimination, it may be uh, eliminating discrimination, it may be overall investment policy, it may be the whole way the economy is run. But at, le at least the way it was presented, it was very sort of projectized. The, s the second point is what you said about measurement. And of course, everything you said about measurement is totally valid. But on the other hand, it leaves people open not to measure because it's so complicated. And I'm waiting for the day when the world development indicators include measures of, of what I call horizontal inequalities or well, your sorts of inequalities and exclusion, because it will be that day when countries begin to take that seriously and when people can begin to dialogue with countries as to whether there's improvement or worsening. So I hope that you could be more brave about measurement, even at the cost of it not being very precise or very beautiful, your measure. Thanks very much, Francis. Um, Come over here, please. Yeah. My name is Veena Ravichandran. I'm Senior Research Advisor for CDKN here at ODI. I used to lead the Innovation for Inclusive Development Program at the IDRC. Um, I find that, uh, you know, years of work on inclusive development, I want to congratulate. This is an excellent, brilliant piece of work. And uh, it's not easy, the conceptual challenges and the huge uh, difficulties of uh, not only defining but setting the boundary. Um, we find that this, um, the discourse on inclusion exclusion is, is quite advanced, uh, both in research and in terms of attention policy in the BRICS countries, not including Russia, Brazil, China, India, 
and uh, South Africa. One of the things we found in India particularly, the poverty, spatial poverty map is almost concurrent with um, the way agriculture has been um, institutionalized, uh, the way institutions have uh, infused science, technology, and uh, policies, and extension services. In other words, for decades or several decades, four or five decades, the way um, agricultural development was introduced has created large parts of resource intensive agriculture because we have the means and, uh, and rain, f rain dependent uh, dotted with farmer suicides and so on. In such a big macro scale, what do you think is, is would be an approach on an entry point? And a second question is given we have all donors, we all have limited resources, if we were to invest uh, in terms of return on investments, where would be the entry point? Thank you very much. I think there was one last question from there, and then we'll go back to the panel, and then we'll have another round after that. Um, hello, my name is Janira Romero from um, doing a master's in education, gender, and international development at the Institute of Education. And I first want to start off by saying, Caroline, thank you for um, adding some of those uh, uh, challenging um, questions to address as well, because um, I also believe that the distribution and negotiation power of women is something that should be addressed in, um, in the inclusion. Uh, social inclusion, but something else that um, that I've noticed, you briefly talked about indigenous people, but um, in, in relations to um, Guatemala, where uh, there was a political genocide for over 30 years, um, we see there that the government itself was oppressing the culture of the indigenous people. And I think that's something that should be brought up as well. It's not just indigenous people, but it's culture. Um, and seeing the policies and programs that the uh, World Bank I is working on, um, maybe it's favoring the elitist. And so the question is, how is this really improving social inclusion of indigenous people in, the, in these three areas of um, market services and space without oppressing the indigenous culture? That's it. Thank you very much indeed. Let's go back to the panel now because there's some fairly meaty questions there. Maitri, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Thanks, uh, thanks Andy, everyone, very much. I just want to, um, two things that, uh, I mean, so Ricardo's big point of uh, what are the links between concentration of wealth and political processes slash social exclusion. I think that that's something we need to think about uh, sort of both the channels as well as are there any empirical ways in which we can and think about these relationships so so certainly I mean I think that in terms of future work that's that's certainly a, a way in which to um, link these two agendas of income inequality and social social exclusion I think we've talked a little bit about that before but perhaps um, on power it's interesting Caroline that you um, I think you're spot on where you say that this this is really about power but the authors don't realize it um, that's that's actually a very uh, very interesting I, I think yes it is true and I think part of it is yes probably we don't realize as much as it is about power but partly I think when you're when you have a report of this kind that you want digestible not by the converted uh, but by people who are not necessarily thinking about these issues, um, you tend to understate some of these um, ideas and w and wait for someone else to do draw that inference. So part of it was strategic and part of it was exactly right. We probably not we don't quite realize how much of it is about power. But uh, oh, I thought there was a fire alarm. <laughs> um, all right, a and and completely. Um, I think that some of the points that you've made certainly are are extremely important. Unfortunately, we can't. We, we could do another summary, but we could e um, equally do something that takes <coughs> some of this work forward. And and that's th those are the kinds of ideas that we are very interested in. Is that what can we do that kind of pushes the boundaries of some of these uh, some of these issues, not just in a in an aggregative, synthetic fashion, but um, more empirically, sort of m moving it forward with with um, unusual data, uh, if, if you like. 
Um, and then again, Jen's point as well. It's the, it, it's similar kinds of issues. How do we how do we think about pushing this? And we've again, um, you and I have had this conversation as well. And and perhaps that's uh, an, another conversation we sh we should all have is is what are we thinking? So again, this is not something that we that we want necessarily only the World Bank or, uh, to do, but this is something that uh, for a broader agenda for people going forward, for professors to talk to their students about. Uh, we had a very interesting, uh, one of our, our core team members um, is, is a professor at Georgetown University. She she left the World Bank and is, is teaching there and, and teaches actually a, a graduate seminar course that uses this as the focus. So she, she actually teaches from this book and asked questions about what's the kind of agenda that you would like to see going forward and what, what kind of papers should student, students write on it. And we found some wonderful, wonderful papers <coughs> that um, we gave them three questions and fabulous pieces that have come from students. So I think those are the kinds of things we need to use much more to, to sort of ignite new thought um, that on, on this issue. Um, again, on the political agenda, I mean, I think that there's also a strategic question there is, is how much to push on the political agenda and how much of it will make people nervous on the, on the politics of it and, and how do we sort of frame it in a way that doesn't make people nervous but to say, look, you know, this is political, but then anything you do or don't do is also political, so might as well be aware of the fact that this is political and then and see how you move forward. And Dr. Stewart, I mean, uh, certainly your your work has is as it was cited here is uh, has been um, we've we've read it, used it, and uh, I think um, the projectizing. I I think it's this the book itself is not project projectized enough. In fact, it's it's much more. Um, so the final <coughs> chapter of this book is really on uh, what can we do. So and that's much more on kinds of policies. Uh, that changed the dynamic in market services spaces. So for instance, land policy, and one of the points that we make is that we can't find a direct correlation between land reforms and social inclusion, but it is true that countries or regions that have had significant land reforms, land redistribution, or even just land survey and measurement tend to have better um, social inclusion outcomes. So uh, we talk in terms of land reforms and, and a range of other much more macro level po policy changes, and, and you're absolutely right. But I think at that point, we were we, the feedback that we got was, this is way too macro. So <laughs> what do we do about, um, and one of the great things about this work, and, and we were very overwhelmed midway, and now one of the great things is that oh, it's either very macro or too micro, so can we get more <laughs> of this? And which is great, because um, it's not something that we necessarily have to do ourselves, but that it s sort of sets an agenda for, for this work going forward. And I'm also a bit, I, I'm kind of conflicted on this measurement issue. You're absolutely right that if you don't, uh, m I mean, we have a we have a, mm, a, a little slide somewhere that says measure what you value. Essentially, the measures that are classic measures are measures of things that society or the donor community or uh, ministries, uh, ministries of finance value. Um, and that said, I, I still feel that the minute you say this is about ethnicity, so proportion of ethnic groups that lack safe drinking water. Now, yes, but then what happens in relatively homogeneous communities where ethnicity is not, in Bangladesh for instance, ethnicity, this, this indicator isn't going to make it, you know. So I guess I, I, th I would prefer much more to move the conversation a little bit further on principles for measurement and while seeing very clearly that yes having at least one measure that addresses social inclusion would be a very welcome change and which is why I think this uh, we have this kind of a cascading uh, methodology of uh, starting with all so in this case projects um, using a set of keywords to then delineate a uh, certain number of projects that have the are addressing social inclusion and then others uh, that are not and and this is going to be a very difficult conversation we are going to have and can keep you posted on how that grow, uh, how that moves but i'm i'm still conflicted on the measurement and, uh, on good days i think yes it's possible and then other things say no this is not something doable and bina your um your uh, point i mean i 
I really don't know that I have an answer to the what returns on investment. This is the kind of question we do get asked at the bank a lot. Is So one of the questions that I have no answer to is, tell me that addressing social inclusion is going to make my electricity project better. I can't. I, I can't tell you that that's the case. I can't empirically tell you that, that that that's the case. I I can intuitively tell you that that's the case. I can tell you from a range of other things, but are there any impact evaluations that actually tell me that addressing these aspects of social inclusion will make your thermal power project better? Probably not, because um, the data on that is extremely scant. Um, on the other hand, if you measure rate of uh, rate of returns in terms of social returns or political returns, then, and that measurement hasn't taken place, uh, then I think that, that there could be. And so I think it's much more of a building a narrative. So on, again, on the measurement issue, this is sort of re related to this, the, the measurement issue. Can you come up with a number that says that your investment is going to be better because, and um, very interesting conversation that we had with the World Bank's chief economist, a very well-known economist called um, Kaushik Basu, uh, where he has a blog uh, that we cite in this report that says, get away from the measurement, focus on the narrative. Let's get the, at least let's get the narrative straight first before we um, close the loop on measurement. And coming from the World Bank's chief economist, I think it's, it's a fantastic way forward that says, wait a minute, I mean, I'm, I don't want a number on this thing. I want the conversation on this thing. And and again, on, on yours as well, the entry points, I think it's really important. So. Just to get back on this idea of e entry points, as we're doing this assessment of projects and coming up with ways to assess social inclusion or otherwise, and also we have a sort of a, like to think with some methodology that <coughs> assesses what a good social inclusion project is, or what a good what project that assesses, that addresses social inclusion well is. The next step to that, when we were presenting this work to uh, people that work on certain countries, they said, we want you to come in and look at not just projects that were uh, approved in the last three years, but all projects to tell us where the entry points are and where the missed opportunities are. So I think that this, these kinds of conversations are exactly what we want. And it's really process intensive. It's very, um, you know, the first time you do it, it's it's hell because you you never get the methodology straight. But I think that the first few times that you do it is exactly piloting this idea. So hopefully, we'll be able to have a I'll be able to have a slightly more informed answer to the to your question in six months. But at this point, I think I can only sort of think about um, this this idea and uh, your question on on Guatemala and and IP and indigenous peoples and culture. I think it's really really important um, issue. Is and and this is, I guess this is a, a classic um, you know uh, debate and a tension between does inclusion mean assimilation, and is assimilation a good thing or a bad thing? And if it's a good thing or a bad thing, from whose perspective is it a good thing or a bad thing? Um, but again, that's a conversation that that really needs to be had, and exactly in this kind of an informed way, is that. Um, is yes, you can give. So one of the, you know, one of the policymakers that I, I once worked with in in India said something like, "Let's just pick up all these tribal hamlets are so dispersed. There is no way we can give them uh, water. You think we can send water and water? Uh, we can we can lay pipes for ten households on one little hillock and ten on another. We need to move them all and put them in one place so that at least we can deliver services." No shock, uh, but at that point of time, this was 20 years ago, there wasn't shock. People thought it was a perfectly you know, reasonable thing to do. So I think this, this idea of, of culture of indigenous people, uh, inclusion on whose terms, by whom, I think are, are really, really important issues. Thanks very much, Maitri. I'm going to go back to the audience now, and I'll give um, you two a chance when, when we've got all the comments in. So. <coughs> Karen Holzman, I'm a consultant, and I'm interested to hear um, ideas and how you might socialize this in the private sector and business community, because when I read the reflections, it talks a lot about practitioners, policy makers, and researchers, but I think particularly on the market and services piece, there's a real opportunity to gauge the 
the private sector. And then thinking also along the business community, um, in terms of working with them to better understand inclusion, because they, they can break through and transcend inclusion in terms of customer insight, understanding drivers and motivations, and bringing people along in a journey where you don't think they're actually going to be included in that market, but they, they come along in terms of these kind of crossing the chasm type of innovation curves. So I'm just wondering, how do you take a product like this and engage the private sector in the conversation? Thanks very much for that. So I think just in front of you, in front of you. Hi, my name is Becky Carter. I'm a researcher with the Governance and Social Development Resource Centre based at IDS. Um, I'm just interested to know, related, but slightly taking us away from the report, but in your opinions on how the post-2015 agenda is going in terms of including social inclusion and equality issues, and what, if anything, you would want to strengthen in the way that agenda is going. Thanks. Oh, yep, there, and then I'll come over here. Uh, I'm Tricia Barnett. I'm a, a director of an organization called Equality in Tourism, uh, which is creating change for women in tourism, which is a massive global industry which is overlooked. And if I just look at tourism in relation to this presentation, I sort of get a little bit of a panic attack. Um, the whole power issue, the whole power structure, is seems to really not have been, I, of course I've not read anything, properly addressed in relation to both power, political power, and in both relation to business power and corruption. Right. And um, I wonder how this actually fits into the MDGs. Are we abandoning the MDGs? Did they fail so much? Are we abandoning, you know, poverty, <coughs> make, you know, make poverty history? Are all those things being abandoned for this social inclusion package, or is it um, engaged absolutely within poverty uh, reduction programs? Yeah. I think the short answer to that is no, but I'll let the panelists yeah. come back on Then that way. makes me seriously <laughs> anxious. Um, can we come over here, please? This, yeah. Thanks. I'm Ellie Chowns from Christian Aid in the University of Birmingham. Uh, it's the question about your definition of social inclusion. Um, the, you had those three com components, ability, opportunity, and dignity of people to take part. I, it seems to me that that's grammatically slightly awkward, the dignity part. And I wonder if it's conceptually a bit awkward as well. I wonder if you could say a bit more about where that fits in. So improving ability to take part is about improving individuals' abilities. Improving opportunities is about improving the the scope for them to exercise those abilities within the broader society. The improving people's dignity to take part, I, if you could explain a bit more about how that's conceptualized, I find that helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, I'm a freelance, uh, Ian Lane, a freelance consultant. Um, I wonder if, um, just from the discussion today, the emphasis has been more on the outcome rather than process. I was uh, three years ago on a World Bank identification mission in India with the National Dairy Development Board for a further expansion of the, uh, the, the, the white uh, flood, the, the, the milk production scheme. And with about, we, we had a meeting of the whole board and their officials about the same number of people as in this room. I was shocked. There was only one woman. She was the chairman. <coughs> her husband has been the chairman before her. But the whole objective of the program to improve livelihoods at the village level, largely impacting on the women, and the whole process was determined by men. Thanks very much. I think um, we'll come back to the panel now. Um, I would also like to, um, I, I did warn my chair, I was going to ask this, um, ask her to think about the current reorganisation at the World Bank, or to talk about that a bit, because the, this um, work was taken forward within the social development department that doesn't exist anymore as a freestanding 
unit. It's now with Urban and Social. So I just wanted um, to question whether the, if you like, whether you feel the political momentum that you had in the preparation of this report with the support of the Vice President and the Director, whether you think that's going to be solidly maintained going forward. Okay, but let me go to Ricardo first now as we come along. Yeah, thank you. No, <coughs> very quickly, uh, I, I really like your comment, Caroline, that this is about power. Uh, and, and and then the, the obvious consequence that is that that all this is political. So 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 exclusion is, is is about power, and it's it's a political process, which leads to to kind of like two points. One is is the World Bank the best organization position to deal with it if it's a political process, and the second one is uh, again, and I, I, I guess I'm belaboring the point, which is. Uh, Development and the development process is relational. So, so, so the relative position is very important, and I think that's that's the main conclusion that I got from from reading your report and and, and reading a lot of uh, different stuff. Is like that that idea that that absolute living uh, standards of living is 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 the focus of of, of policies and, and and agendas in the bank uh, cannot go on. So, so the, the World Bank needs to recognize, at least, even if, if it can deal with the political process to reduce exclusion, that 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 development is a, is a re, uh, there's a relative element, a very important relative element in, in in development, and I think that's that's the challenge for you and your team, including you know in this new restructure, that uh, that the bank accepts that as as, as part of like as a central part of the, the 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 new agenda and the shared prosperity that that shared prosperity cannot uh, ignore that, that element of, 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 of power relations and, and the fact that uh, there's a zero-sum game element in there. Thank you. Caroline. OK, I'm going to try and just uh, sum up all the questions. <laughs> and I hope I touch on some of them. Um, so um, starting with the, uh, a few references to the post-2015 agenda. Um, I think social inclusion is on there in several different areas and should be on there. Um, and personally, I think that um, <coughs> issues around gender um, should be a standalone goal, and I think that that would lead the way for other inclusive actions. Um, obviously, it can't cover all inclusive actions because there are many different identities out there, but um, I think when Jen talks about talking about populations, we actually do need to talk about populations, and um, the gender issue is a population-wide issue that I think should be on the post-2015 agenda. Moving from there to measurement, because that's very important for the post-2015 agenda as well, um, I'm, I actually think we should um, both have narratives and measurement um, together. I think the narrative should be strong, and I think the measurement should support the narratives, and what we don't have are in relation, I think probably, uh, certainly in relation to gender, but I think probably in relation to um, inclusion as well, are measurements that show transformative change. We tend to have measurements that show outcomes, and I think we could have measurements that show transformation. Um, so, for example, I know that some people working on some measurements are looking um, at something like the care economy. Very difficult to measure, but not impossible. I mean, if we think these things are important, then let's put the resources where we think the important things are that should be measured. And something like the a care economy would show you um, a transformative change in relation to gender. Um, culture has been mentioned. Um, yes, very important, obviously very important in relation to this report. Um, and I think it's a very tricky one in that it can be um, elites in, within different cultures can use um, their culture as an excuse. I actually think that we've come quite a long way <coughs> that it is no longer acceptable to use culture as an excuse for any elite um, for a, what is could be a human rights abuse. And so I think we have to um, get beyond the elite in any culture and make sure that we are, are looking at human rights. And I think the human rights framework um, is a very useful framework and should be used more than it currently is. Um, and finally, on the issue, going back to the issue of power, um, this question about the definition of um, ability, opportunity, and dignity. Um, I think, for me, the dignity one is about power, actually. And I think in the other framework, the space one can be about power. Um, and I think that there's been a lot in the bank about power. I mean, all the work on participation in the bank that's been going on for 20 plus years is about negotiating power. 
Um, and I think a reference to that in terms of the way you put this out could really usefully enhance um, some of the work that's been done already from the bank. Thanks very much, Caroline and Ricardo. I'm just going to overload Maitri with one last question that's come in online. Um, Jennifer Iazuta, freelance journalist based in Dakar, on behalf of Irene. Youth unemployment in West Africa is a huge issue. What can be done to include more young people in the labour force? Okay. And so you have now a lot of questions in the last word. I do. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, on the private sector, I so the book itself actually does have, um, Karen, your, your point, the book actually does have um, quite a bit on private sector, though not enough. Uh, I do feel that that is a, a huge area that um, we need to, um, private sector as a player, both in terms of its um, positive and its potentially negative role, um, is, is extremely important. And I think, um, Trisha, your point as well, in, in related to, to that issue of, of private sector and where the private sector's roles and responsibilities lie, I just think I think we mention it several times. I just don't think we do enough of it. So um, I, I think that's that's really important. On um, on post 2015, I think already um, Caroline has responded. I'm um, not front and center in that discourse, but certainly the high level panels uh, report for post 2015 has uh, you know leave no one behind. It, it's 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 front and center about this. I think my um, my maybe my concern as well as my um, uh, contribution to that is that we could perhaps make some of those ideas much more concrete in terms of um, going forward, but <coughs> it's early days yet on that conversation. I, is it about are we abandoning poverty? I would say absolutely not. I think that issues of social inclusion um, in many countries intersect with issues of poverty. So there are there are countries where if you ask people what is your key, what do you understand by social inclusion or social exclusion, they would say poverty. And other countries where poverty rates are really low uh, would say, oh, it's about services, it's about voice, it's about something else. So I, I definitely think that uh, poverty is a central aspect of social exclusion and it compounds other things. I think that, that poverty compounds other kinds of exclusions and other kinds of exclusions in turn compound poverty. So a person who comes from, uh, uh, who, who has a disability for instance, uh, the chances that that person will acquire the skills to actually um, not be in poverty are pretty low. In, in certain uh, in certain contexts, and that if they have their families have just risen above poverty, the risk of their falling back in poverty are pretty high. So, I think that the, the co compounding some role of poverty and some of these things is is really really important. Um, yes, I think that we have not addressed um, enough on corruption, except when we look at perceptions of um, people in um, in the Afrobarometer. There are certain questions that the Afrobarometer asks about citizens' take on, on the state. So for instance, is your country, is your government doing enough um, uh, to address inequality? Are you satisfied with what your government is doing to address inequality? Almost the, the overwhelming response is no. They don't think that, that their governments are doing enough. Or um, do you feel excluded by the state? And there's a there's in Af so one of the things that we do say uh, in this in this book is that social exclusion doesn't have to be of the minority. Social exclusion could be about the majority as well. You could have majority populations feeling excluded by the state. And another way I think of of talking about that is is there a capture of the elite of the major uh, institutions? So social exclusion in some sense. So f as we were talking about Brazil, in social exclusion in Brazil could mean very different things than uh, many countries in, say, Africa or Asia where people feel <coughs> excluded by the state or certain populations feel excluded by the state. So I think that that's, um, I don't think that's a, that's a uh, satisfactory answer to your question, but I think that these are, I actually don't think of these as questions, I really think of these as sort of thoughts going, going forward and, and 
I mean, just as social inclusion can't be a closed chapter, I think this is the this is a thread in the narrative, and and hopefully this narrative can be taken taken forward. Um, on dignity, um, it's I think I found very interesting your, uh, the the grammatical, and I'm thinking all the while, okay, I, I'm like a I'm, I'm like a syntax fiend, and then um, and then I'm thinking, okay, so can you enhance you can enhance ability, you can enhance opportunity, can you enhance dignity? And the answer is yes. So I, I guess we uh, on on the grammatical side, I think I acquit myself, um, but on the on the conceptual side. Um, Dignity, I, I think that dignity is um, an idea that we bring into this conversation very much uh, when we say, and, and the only way you can talk about some of these issues is, is through examples. So this example of this tribal woman who refuses to go to a health center, she has the opportunity. So she has a health center where there are doctors and nurses available for her to go and give birth. She has the opportunity. She has the ability, so you know she has a road that would take her. She has transport that would take her, <coughs> but she doesn't go. And and so this is about and and so when you ask her, and this is a hypothetical woman that you actually ask her. Oh, so why are you not going? And th this is actually a real life answer answer that was given, where a group of tribal women actually said we would rather die than go to that health center. And and then it's and and in some uh, the bizarre way they do. I mean that that's that's um, they would rather die than than uh, give birth in health centers that r disrespect them. And there is a lot of literature that's coming out of. Um, in fact, when we were discussing this particular issue within the team, there was one of our team members who had the identical experience in Peru. So this is not peculiar to Adivasis in India. It is a very generic issue of ways in which certain people are treated, because of which they, uh, even when opportunities are available, they would not access them. So um, I think the idea of dignity, we need to put much more center stage. And then, so then the issue is, OK, can you actually measure dignity? Yes, well, ac actually, there are surveys that measure dignity. and of how people feel being treated. Um, but then the question is, OK, so what? So you find out, is there something policy can do about this? And as it turns out, um, the nursing practice in the, at least in the United States, I'm sure elsewhere as well, um, the, the Professional Association of Nurses and the Professional Association of Social wor Workers in the, in the United States actually has built um, you know how they have protocols, training protocols, that say that this is a certain level of technical expertise you must have in order to be a nurse or in order to be a social worker, uh, there's actually, they have developed protocols for what, what they call cultural competence. So it would be cultural competence here in the United States called cultural competency. Um, and there is a, an entire protocol for cultural competency. There are training modules for cultural <coughs> competency. I guess the next step on that is, can you hold providers ex accountable not just for showing up and not just for having technical skills like taking blood pressure and, and, and urine samples and other things, but in the way they treat their patients. So I think that th this conversation on dignity is about framing of dignity within the broader development or in the broader policy context, uh, measuring dignity and what, what we could mean by it, and finally, doing something about it, and then holding people accountable for for um, a certain minimum standard of treating other people in their day-to-day -day interaction. It's a little bit like you know, you can have the, any attitude you want. You can think you can think that women should be should be cooking at the hearth all day. That may be your personal attitude, but you may not act out in the public domain such that it affects other people, such that your attitudes affect other people. So I think that some of those non-negotiables, I think, probably are things that, that could um, be could enhance dignity. And that's a conversation as well that we've been fairly pleased that it's actually become part of not the, the fuzzy stuff, but as part of the more of what can we do in terms of policy and design of programs. So, Again, probably not as satisfactory an answer as, as you would have liked, but I think, again, this is part of a narrative which I think we all collectively need to take forward. 
And I, I completely agree with you on the, um, I, I actually disagree that it's more about outcomes than process. I think that I haven't, as a, in the presentation, <coughs> probably not done enough justice to the, to the process part of it. Um, so I, I think that this is very much about relations and, and process. And also agree with you that it's not just women that um, tend to have decisions made uh, for them by, um, you know, structures of power that don't include them, I think. And also, I mean, I'm hearing a lot of gender slash women. I think there's a lot, there's a crisis also of masculinity. And I think that there are uh, spaces for young men that are shrinking that we uh, need to need to be cognizant of. So it's not just it's not just young women, it's older people, it's uh, young people. So you would find youth organizations where everyone's 50 years <coughs> old. I mean, I think uh, those are um, those are all issues that people sort of need to, wa what's, you're, you're really looking at issues of representation. And I think that those issues of representation are extremely important for, for different groups that have dis different identities. Um, so, Andy, your question, I was going to gloss over, but I'm not. <laughs> um, how does this, um, how, how, what, what does this mean? Um, so, here is, is my honest take on this. Um, yes, this, this is a piece of work that had um, right place, right time for any number of reasons, mm -hmm. including the fact that internally within the World Bank, there was a, con a sort of a, an alignment of stars that was, was pushing the, the work. Um, I think that it has sort of, it, it has become, it, it has sort of hit, it, it has hit the bank and a lot of other um, actors strongly enough that I, I don't think there's, that there is going back on it, number one. Number two, I don't think people want to go back on it. I think that um, this idea of shared prosperity is, um, is so intrinsically linked to this and it's so difficult otherwise to think about shared prosperity except um, unless you think in terms of social inclusion that I, I suspect that this, is, this may well be on autopilot now. Uh, and the reason I say this is because, uh, for instance, one of the, one of the um, I implementation, one of the areas of implementation for the World Bank's new strategy is that every country is required to do what's going to be called a systematic country diagnostic, which is a um, macro level assessment of the key development issues. And uh, social inclusion is in that guidance um, front and center. And it's, it's not about services and it's not about poverty and it's not about, it's about social inclusion and it's about um, what what could happen if you did not address social, uh, so the costs of not addressing social inclusion. Um, so I, I suspect in this, I may be overly optimistic on this, I just don't think so. I also think that there is a space for external actors to hold, um, hold agencies like the World Bank accountable for, um, for actually seeing this, this work forward, and not just the World Bank, but also the World Bank's client countries accountable for, for this. So as I said, this is a thread and a narrative, and that narrative is not owned by one or other organization. I think that this is something that needs to be um, you know, pushed forward in, in many, many different ways. Um, yes, so the, the question that came yeah, online, nice um, youth unemployment in Africa. So one of the plugs that I just wanted to make for um, a new World Bank um, um, piece of work is on actually on youth unemployment in Africa, a report that was released probably two days, uh, maybe on Thursday, I think mm -hmm. Thursday there was a release of a new report on youth employment in Africa. Um, and I, I just don't, I really don't think I'm going to do justice to the, to the issue in one, um, one sentence, partly because I haven't thought enough to um, to give a to give a sound bite of an answer uh, but also I a I would point you to the report that has yeah. been released so if you if you just uh, google that you will get to that that report but I also think that um, I don't actually think we're we're going to uh, release this report in Uganda and uh, next week and and one of the we looked at the afro barometer um, just ahead of that launch uh, to take a look at what people's perceptions of 
the biggest issue that confronts them right now. And across the board, it's unemployment. And, and it's, um, and, and ways in which, these are all ways in which certain yeah. economic um, uh, constraints are actually constraints to social inclusion, so. Maitri, thanks very much indeed. Um, it is, as Carolyn was saying, it's a very rich report. There's a lot of innovative work in it. Um, the handling of the perception data, I think. I hadn't seen anything like that before. So I would encourage people to look at it, as Caroline was it's saying. It's freely downloadable. Yeah. And finally, um, many congratulations on piloting this all the way through the bureaucracy and the special political economy of the bank and getting it out <laughs> in such good shape. And many thanks to you for your excellent presentation and also to Ricardo and Caroline for some very, very good comments. So thanks very much to the panel. Thank you.